No, morning. <laughs> just about, just about. Um, yes, route to board security. It's been a hot topic. Very hot topic. And it's a topic I was a bit dubious about taking on because there are so many things floating around at the moment. I may not catch all of them. I may not get all of them. So as we're going on, I am more than happy for you guys to raise your hand when I'm talking. We're not going to leave it to the very last minute and then you've got to remember what we were doing you know, 15 minutes ago. So please, stop me as we're rolling on. I'm more than happy to talk as we're going through and sort of, in a way, it's almost like one of my training classes. I'd rather you have conversation as we're going through the presentation. So, who am I? I'm Barry Higgins. I've made a living in IT since 1996, thereabouts, so pretty much starting to be in the dinosaur range. Um, done various things over the years, but uh, the one that I'm sort of rear, I got into the Migratic side of things was I became a WISP in 2009. Um, again, that was due to the fact that I wandered off to a mum in Poland. And it was a case of, oh, I can do this. Came back home, started up my own little WISP in my local little areas, which is just about 25 miles down the road. And that's where it started. Got hooked into the Microtech for the, the bang for buck sort of scenario where it was nice and cheap. And I did actually get quite a good value for money. Um, took a while, I've got the, the WISP running. And then I decided, you know what? I know a lot about it now. Let's go and get the certificates. Hence, I then decided to become a consultant in 2015. And not very long later, I then decided to do the training course to become a trainer, so in 2016. I will state, I am not a security expert. Let's get that out there now. I am not a security expert. What I have done, though, is accumulated as much knowledge as I can and hopefully present to you in the next you know, 30 minutes, 45 minutes, as much as we can get to make it as safe as we can. Oh, uh, yeah, shameless plug alert. <laughs> Riga, I'm one of the trainers. <laughs> As Ron may have mentioned earlier on in the previous one, we've got somebody who's obviously applauding there because he was there, you were there in June. Yep, June. Hands up all those who've been to Riga to do their training with us. Yeah, quite a few. Good, good, good. Spread the word, spread the word. Yes, that was the summer. That's the five of us. You can't really see who we are in there, but Leo, Menno, Lorenzo, Ron and myself. Some happy pictures. We were do, definitely doing a lot of work. It was hard graft. It really was hard, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Just keep nodding. Keep nodding. <laughs> uh, yeah, just think, I, I put this one. This is... She was the favourite for quite a few of the students in the summer. That, that's Santa. Um, I gather she will be there at Christmas as well. Um, after the success of the first two editions of the Microtech Riga Training Bootcamp comes Riga Training Bootcamp 3. Yes, as in all the best sequels, we've now gone to number three. It's from the 6th to the 12th of November. Six days of training, five skilled trainers, 10 different training courses, and a multitude of combinations are available. There's our schedule, roughly broken down. You, we've got two sets, first three days, a day off, then the last three days. Um, you can book now to get the, the early bird price. The refresh renew rate is um, 135 pound or 150 euros. And obviously single course and double courses, it's all there. We have a stand. It's out there, you can't miss it. Um, so please, feel free, come and have a chat to us. If you feel like you want to get some more training and you want to get some more certificates to prove that you know what you know, come see us. We might be able to do you a good deal. So, the importance of security. Why do we need to have our router boards secure? Anybody just want to throw it out there and say, no, okay, you're just going to sit there and stare me out. Well, I can do that too. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, ge I'm guessing you're already having a play. I mean, you, obviously we've been watching the logs. You log in, oh, let's have a play. Let's see how fast it can handle. Oh, let's see what's open. Let's start scanning. That's just the Wi-Fi. Imagine if you sat in an office and bored, stupid, and you've got an Ethernet port that's not locked. Oh, let's have a play. So yes, why? We don't want to be part of an attack. 
and we certainly don't want to share all our secrets. That's as, as narrowed down as I can get it to get the two points across as regarding security. <clears throat> so what should we do? Well, I could bring up that famous cartoon picture of a Ethernet plug in a rubber seal that gets put into the switch, disconnect from the internet completely. <laughs> we can't do that. Unfortunately, people do actually like to get to the websites. So, we've just got our box. What do we do with it? Factory default or bespoke? Well, I am surprised still by the amount that still use factory default. So I am actually going to try as best as I can to make it safe with the factory default. Now, this, this really ha I mean, I'm, I can feel people glaring at me already. You don't teach people to use factory default. We always wipe it and go from fresh. No. This particular moment in time, I am going to talk to you on how to make factory default just that little bit safer. First off, do not connect your router to the internet until you have done at least the following. Created an admin user password. How many routers are being exploited every hour at the moment because nobody has put a password on it? I believe, according to one, one scan, the, there was something like 70 odd thousand in Scandinavia that were wide open. A lot, an awful lot. Um, secondly, once you've done your password, disable everything that's listening for a connection, the services. Thirdly, update router OS to the latest stable or long-term version. Oh, was, is it long-term now or, yeah, it is long-term. Um, I won't say what the, uh, the, the nickname to it is now. <laughs> we have got a nickname for it already. Um, love you long time. Yes, go for the long version, the bug fix. Anyway, set an admin user password. This is the first thing you should do if this is the way you want to go. It's not my preferred choice, I'll be honest. I would actually just not use the admin user at all. But some like it. There we go. A screenshot. Winbox, once you manage to log in, there's reasons why there aren't any stars in that box. There's no password. Put your password in. And yes, that really is eight stars. <laughs> I've come across passwords like that, have you? It's either password, password123, or star, 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 because, well, that's what it is, isn't it? There it is on the CLI, just in case you're some of these guys that likes to work on the CLI, once again, this password is actually slightly different. I think it's got about three stars more. Um, but, yeah, just demonstration. So let's go one stage better. Let's create a new user with a password. We're starting to get a little bit stronger. Then we'll disable the default admin account. These are basics, but these are the bits that need to be hardening up your router from, from the box, straight out of the box. System, users, into the users window, click the plus, new user even if it has got eight stars as its password, add it in there. Because now we have created a new unknown for the hacker. He doesn't know that new username. Well, unless he's using an old version of Router OS, and he might be able to find it. Log out the user admin and log in with the new user to disable the admin account. There's the terminal CLI version of it. Why? Because we have created two unknowns that have to be acquired now before logging in, plus removing a partially known login. All the hackers out there know admin exists, or usually exists on an un, uh, untreated router with no password, or it might be a password. They could brute force it, they could keep going on with it, or they could use the, the latest Winbox hack and be able to see the whole password and username combination anyway, but that's been fixed. New user, new password. It's a lot safer. Also note, adding an allowed address range has reduced the risk of unwanted logins from other networks. We've now made it even harder to get into. Such simple, basic security that isn't in there from default. Where do we put it? Where was it? There it is. We're now just saying we don't want anybody logging in except from that range. Yep, for now that covers the more serious points. The factory default doesn't do for you, okay? However, 
we did mention right at the beginning, the services. Telnet, API, FTP, Winbox, SSH, they're all alive. All sat there with their ears wide open, listening. Who wants to connect? Come to me, come to me. Let's get rid of them. Shut them down. Shut your API down. If you don't know what it is, you don't need it. API LSSL, if you don't know what it is, shut it off. FTP, to be honest, shut it off because you're not really going to be using it as an FTP server. SSH, you might want to connect to your router. Fine, I understand that. SSH, pretty strong. Not fantastic, but it's pretty strong. What's the next one on the list? Telnet, really? Is that still switched on? We should be switching that off as the first thing. Telnet, off. Winbox. Well, we need Winbox, because that's how I've got this picture. So we have to have Winbox on. We can limit it down, but we'll come to that a little bit later on. So Winbox is still running. It's now safer with the later router OS versions. Clearly, there was a problem, um, which hopefully has been fixed. I've not heard any other rumors yet that it hasn't been. And we've got the WWW or the WWSSL. <laughs> it shuts off the web GUI. Great, because let's face it, most of those routers out there that have been hacked are because of web GUIs. It's port 101. Let's have a look. It's port 80, actually, but I'm sort of saying room 101, port 101. Um, port 80. You scan it. Oh, found a website. Oh, what is it? Log in. Here we go. Let's have some fun. Switch it off. Because immediately you've just annoyed some of the hackers out there because that's their limit of, you know, of knowledge, websites. Here we have the CLI version. Just in case, I'm obviously putting all this in here so that you can read it as the slides go on later on and you can download it uh, from the website. But straightforward again, IP service, you can actually do it all in one hit. Telnet, comma, FTP, comma, WW, comma, 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 comma. Off in one go. Great. At this point, we're nearly safe enough to connect to the internet. Yeah. But we've got to update it. We have to update router OS because, let's be honest, there have been a few little holes over the last few months that people have been poking at and having fun. Let's update router OS. Why should you? Quite simply, it is the one way to minimize any legacy exploits. Update via your preferred method. Yeah, sub-note. This is a dilemma at this point. Connect to the internet and risk a syscom package update. Or less risky methods of downloading via an alternative device and then uploading the, router to the, uh, the package to your router. Take your risk, take your chance. Me personally, if I was not taking any risks, I would download the, the package that I need to update the router with. Um, to be honest, I've always got it on a laptop somewhere. Uh, or you could just, for that few seconds, try the, the system package update. At which point, system package check. Now, personally speaking, I would go with the bug fix. Sorry, long time, love you long time mix, whatever it's called. Um, bug fix. Select that one, because we don't run production. Um, we don't, sorry, run the current on production systems. We certainly don't run beta in production systems. We run the bug fix version. Sorry, long time version. Um, there you'll see there are various version numbers. It's also got a bit of a change log as regarding what's happening and what's been fixed or what's been broken. Um, click OK, hopefully, so long as you've got internet access, your router will update. As I said, I really, if you want to be 100% sure safe, do the update via the other methods of FTPing it to it or dragging and drop through Winbox. And there we have the, the CLI version of it again. System package update set, channel equals the bug fix, long time links, whatever they call it. Uh, we've got our versions there. And then the other one is the system package update install. And let it do its business. One bit, everybody forgets this bit. Well, I say everybody, everybody that doesn't know about it, router boot. It's another little part that you need to update. So once your router's come back online after doing its update, let's do the router boot update too. You'll find it in system, router board, 
click the up, well, in fact, if you find that your numbers are all, your version numbers are all a bit of a mishmash, and your upgrade num firmware does actually say that it's a greater number than the current firmware, well, upgrade it. If you don't, you might find weirdness happens. That's the only way I can describe it. You ask any of the trainers, it's just weirdness. Things don't always work as you'd expect. We can't put a finger on it, exactly what it is. Just check your firmware, check the router boot. You might find it's out of date or the wrong version. That's it. Thanks for listening. I'm off. Ta da. <laughs> oh, 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 sorry, sorry, there's more, there's more. Do you trust the land side? Is it just you in the network? Okay, you can trust it. Um, is it an office? Hmm. Do you trust them? No. Do you trust 200 guys sat there in the chairs all scanning the Wi-Fi? No. That's landside. Right. We better harden it up a little bit more then, because in the default factory settings, we have Mac servers, neighbor discovery. Um, yeah, I've, I've included the spelling alteration for the Americans and the English of us. And active NT Ethernet ports. And we have what we call the B-test server. They're all actively listening for connections. La la la, anybody out there want to have a go? Let's switch them off. Disable the Mac servers. The Mac servers enable connections over layer two via Ethernet Mac Turnit or Mac Winbox. Disable if you do not want them active. To be honest, I would switch them off. Once you've got a happy, stable network and you've got people in that network, switch them off. If you've got devices on that network, switch them off. You don't need the access. Where do you find it? This time, you'll find the servers are in tools. <coughs> Mac Turnit server, Mac Winbox server. The allow interface list. Well, we'll just say no list, none. Switch it off. It's gone. There we have it in the CLI. Discovery, uh, sorry, neighbor discovery. Neighbor discovery allows your router to be seen by other devices and information of those devices seen by your device. You're bleeding out info. Hi there, I'm running Microtik version 6.25. It's really, really bad for access. Come and have a poke. Neighbor discovery protocol, NDP. Cisco Discovery Protocol, CDP, they are similar. They both leak out the same information. At the same time, the report information, your router can see what's on that network using the same protocol. IP neighbors, there it is. Look at the information. If I can find the little, is there a little, no, not on this one there isn't. If I had the beam, I would point it to IP address allocation, identities, the platform. You will see Cisco information there as well if it's switched on. The version that it's running. Oh, look, we have a long-term one. That means I must be keeping up to date with my updates. Um, the type of router. Was there anything specific about that router that had a problem security-wise? Is it running IPv6 and uptime? You might think it's innocent information. It isn't. Every little bit that you can glean about a device, what version it's running, you can refer back to your notes if you're a hacker and go, that version had a hole in whatever. That had a problem in that one. Let's work on it. Bang, 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 bang. Let's stop advertising it. Let's switch it off. IP, neighbors, discovery settings, interface, None. We don't want to listen and we don't want to tell. There it is in the CLI. IP neighbor discovery settings, set the discovery interface list to none. Switch it off. Okay, what's left? You've got a nice little router. You've got all your patch leads going all off around the walls. And then you find that there's half a dozen sockets that aren't actually connected to anything. But your router's listening or your switch is listening. Do you just leave them on? No, you don't leave them on. You switch them off. Because it doesn't take five seconds for somebody to plug something in, get a DHCP lease, whatever, they've instantly got into your network, they're behind your firewall, they're starting to look. 
they're getting deeper into it, they start to play. Switch those ports off. Various different methods to access them, and again, there are various different ports that they could be switching on and off. Ethernet, SFP ports, even wireless. If you don't want it, switch it off. How do you switch it off? Well, in the Ethernet side of things, straightforward, disable. And there it is in CLI. Yeah, on the subject of ports, um, wireless interface. Your map, your hap light, switch it on, wireless is on. Guess what? No password. It's there listening. Come on, connect. Anybody can connect to my internet because the idiot administrator hasn't set a password. Depending on the model, the wireless may be open to connection without any password required. Um, absolute minimum, add a password. How to? You create a new, I, I always create a new security profile. I find leaving, I then leave the defaults alone, or disable them, whatever, but leave them alone. I create a new security profile, then assign the profile to all the wireless interfaces requiring it. Hopefully Ron's not watching this because there's a couple of bits I've missed about security. I haven't really gone into the full depth that Ron did earlier on. Um, but here we have it. First of all, I create a new security profile. I've called it new security profile. Mode, dynamic keys. I'm only using WPA2 PSK because we all know WPA is a waste of time. I'm using just the AES ciphers on the, there. And yes, that really is all stars. Done. That's my security profile. But if I just quickly whiz over to here, the default wireless interface, open it up. It's using now, I've told it to use the new Wi Fi profile. OK, OK. It's at least now got password set. Because we are still playing with the factory default. Yeah, really safe, this factory default, isn't it? You may as well just wipe it and start all over again, because that's pretty much what you're going to have to do. There's the CLI for it. Um, it can get a little bit complex if you're working on CLI and wireless with all the different options. Then the other thing that was in that list, why disable the B-test server? Guess what? It's listening. Port 2000. And yes, as I put there, like moths to a flame, it'll draw the inquisitive to your router. They may not be able to do anything with it, but they may know what it is. They might find a way of logging in. They may have found your password. Next thing you know, you'll find you can't understand why you've got no bandwidth left, because they're playing with your bandwidth tester. Here we go. Switch it off. Very simple. Tools, bandwidth server, enabled. Well, untick, it's not enabled anymore. Strange one. But do you trust it? Caspers is smiling. <laughs> do you trust Microtik Cloud Time Update? Did you know it was on? Most, did any, any out there know that that's actually running? As you did, a few. Um, me, personally, I switch it off. When it comes to time updates, personally, I would like to be able to get an update from my own server, or at least a server that I can trust and I have a rapport with. Um, so straightforward enough, IP cloud, untick, update time. That's on, even if you do, factory default, reset, no config. It's still on. No, bit of a bugbear. I'd, I'd rather have that switched off. I might submit that to support at some point. <laughs> it might be better to set your own NTP client to a server you are more familiar with. In that case, we'd need to know how. There we have it. System. SMTP client enabled. And yes, that's a bogus IP. One, two, three, four. Yeah, it, it's not really an NTP server. And finally. If you want to be really, really, really thorough, check what packages are running and decide if you really need them to be available. There's reason in the logic. Say a hacker does get in and he's got all the packages available to him to play with and they're all on, enabled, it's going to do more damage. If they're disabled, removed, switched off, he's got to go through the hassle of downloading, installing, updating, rebooting, so 
it's not really a cure, it's just a delay. Disable them, remove them. If you want to remove them, just disable them. It, it's just another slowing down point. We all know eventually somebody will break in, you know, no different to trying to lock your house. If they, they get in, they get in. You can just make it harder for them to do any more work with it. So this is one of those hardening techniques. Um, as you can see there, I've gone into my system package window box and I've highlighted them and then I've just clicked the disable button and it says scheduled for disabled. It means I've got to reboot it before they are disabled, but at least I now know I haven't got hotspot, MPLS and PPP running on that machine. Okay. Ooh. I'll do that. Thank you. Um, what if you choose not to go with the factory default? Well, to be honest, it's probably the better option. But um, the main key here is you'll know what the router has been configured to do. If it's blank, you've got to get it to work and you've got to make sure it's doing all the right things. This is why in most of the MTCNAs that I always teach, as does Ron and various other trainers, we work to make sure that you've got your router from scratch, not with a factory default. Because far too often we all come across when we're on consultancies uh, where the router has been left with the factory default and they've added this bit, added that bit, added something else, and they go, oh, it's not working. Well, why is it not working? And then we dig into it and we find mm, they've still got the factory default on there, weren't aware that this particular IP was in that range, they weren't aware that DHCP was doing that and so on and so on. Wipe it, start afresh, know where you're standing. It's not for everyone though, granted. You know, when I, I, I have to admit, what, nearly 10 years ago when I first started playing with Router OS, it was, it was a little bit smaller then, um, but I started off with factory default. I then worked my way through it, and picked my way through it, and we've now got nearly, what, 10 years of accumulated knowledge as regarding what's secure, what isn't secure, and what you need to do. Um, you are better to leave it with factory defaults if you're unsure what you're doing. Well, except for, of course, changing at least the password. Plus, if you've just woken up, go back to all the other slides and all the other information that we've just gone through because there's a lot of holes in it, so you'll need to do that. So either way you're looking at it, factory default and do everything that's required, or do we go with the bespoke option and wiping it? It's that pop-up window in Winbox. How many of you actually read it? Or do you just click OK? Oh, it's a pop-up. OK. Yeah, read it. Remove configuration. This is if you're going with the bespoke. This is the bit if you want to be brave, you want to try it. By all means, do it on a network that you're not too worried about, that's not going to get damaged too much. Um, there's the CLI version of it. R. For the brave or the experienced, you've just removed that configuration. Oh, what are we going to do now? Router has been cleared of defaults. Not quite. There's still a few things there I wish it would switch off, like cloud update. Um, what do we do? First, check all the security advice in the previous slides regarding factory default. Yeah, go back, go through it all. That includes new username and password. We're not going to bother with leaving the admin on there. We're going to disable it, delete it, get rid of it, have a new one. IP services, switch them all off except the ones we want. But we can now be even more secure with them. Router S and Router B, get that updated. Mac servers, bandwidth test servers, switch them all off. Packages, we've removed all the ones we don't want. What's left? The missing bits. One of the big ones. Oh, the firewall. <laughs> oh, no. I am going to try and keep this simple. I am not going to teach you on how to build a firewall in this bit, this bit, this bit, this bit. I'm just going to give you a guide, what to look for, how to approach it. Breaking it down, we remember that the firewall can protect both the router in, out, and any network available through it. Okay, that's the job of the firewall, to protect your router, everything going through it, in and out and so on. We split that down into three possible chains, as they are known. Input-output chain refer to traffic emanating from the router or destined for the router. The forward chain is any packet going through it. 
not stopping at it and then doing something and carry on. No, it's going through it. Three chains, in, out, forward. I was about to do shake it all about, but it's not the okie koki. Input, output, forward chain. The sequence is allow the packets you want, then block everything else. It is that simple. And keeping it simple is the key with firewalls. The more complex, the more problems, the less likelihood you're going to find where it went wrong, and more than likely somebody's going to get in. So, the accept options, the allowed options. Typically, three ways to approach this. Individual specific rules. One rule to allow this, one rule to allow that, this rule to allow this. Or, one rule that assigns itself to an address list. We're going to accept all those computers, all those devices, all those servers, put them into an address list. Or finally, we can look at new chains, where we combine individual specific rules, address lists, and other tools all into one chain. And we can say, right, all these packets that are coming in, we've recognized what they are. I want you to now go to the new chain and be filtered. Note, the following examples show a combined input-output forward chain. This is for demonstration purpose only and requires individual input, output, and forward chains in actual use. That's my um, warning. As I said, these aren't just cut and paste. These are just to give you guides, OK? I use, just to keep it simple, individual rules utilizing input, output, forward. So in actual fact, there's one, two, three, four, five, six. Six times three. Mm, so one, two, three, four, five, six, yeah, times three. That's at least 18 rules for your input, your output, and your forward. Is it 18? Have I got my maths wrong? One, two, three, four, five, six, times one, two, three. Yeah, 18. Dat myself there. Um, where do you find your firewall? IP, firewall. The filter rules, it's the very first tab. Your filter rules work like this. We have what we call the matcher. The bit that we are looking for to then apply. Whether we want it, whether we don't want it, whether we want to save it, whether we want to add it to an address list, whether, whatever we want to do with this packet, we need to match it to something. We are looking, and our matcher consists of any, anything within these three tabs. General, advanced, and extra. Then, once we've decided what our traffic's going to be, we can then apply what we call the action. So we have our matcher, and the action that we're going to apply to it. In that action, we have various different options from access, uh, sorry, accept, add to destination, source, drop, fast track connection, jump, a whole plethora of stuff there. All of it available on the wiki. And there are plenty of firewall experts that have constructed various basic scripts for you. So please, do not use this as your de facto standard. Just understand the concept of what's going on. Because that won't work as a CI. <laughs> I have created an input-output forward chain. It doesn't, make it, it doesn't exist. You, that's actually a created one. You will need to create your chains according to input, a chain for output and a chain for forward. The matcher criteria, source address equals 192.168.88.0 slash 24. Um, as an example, action. Well, we want to accept that. That's our internal network. Or we don't want to. We want to drop it. So that's the very simple first firewall rule. An individual accept. So this just breaks it down to say, right, we have our chain input, output, forward, and we're just going to accept it. That's actually pretty pointless, because all you've effectively done is left the router in the state that it already was. It was accepting everything anyway. But the rule afterwards then says, drop. So it's dropping everything. So you're allowing everything, then dropping everything. Actually, no, because you've allowed it first, it doesn't see the drop, it carries on. The drop becomes pointless. Once you've found your match traffic and you've allowed it, it doesn't continue through the rest of the firewall. It stops at that point, jumps off, carries on, packet goes. If the packet can't be found in any of your matches, only at that point then does the drop rule come into effect. And it says, oh, well, this is a packet. We don't know what it is. Oh, well, drop gone. Keeps it very, very simple. Using address lists, it just adds a little bit more functionality to how your firewall is going to be controlled. 
And we can create an address list here under address. Um, this one we, I've called whitelist. You could have a blacklist as well if you so wish, but our whitelist is our acceptable list of IPs that we want to have access to our router or through our router. Uh, this particular rule, I've just said 000. zero, zero. Um, but I put a slash zero on there, that would have been even more of a problem. You've just basically allowed everything. So we put that in as our whitelist. Our next rule, well, sorry, our actual rule, the allowing rule that I've put in there, under advanced source address list. I've said, right, anything in my whitelist is now ha does now have an action of accept, as you can see there from the, the CLI. Chains. Chains are now how we build up complex combinations of these filters, these matches, these actions, these address lists. Um, it does get rather involved, it does get rather complex. I have to say, I'm old fashioned. I get out my pen and paper and I start scribbling down. What do I want? Okay, what do I don't want? Done, okay, oh, I want to analyze that. Oh, well, I'll jump that to my analyzing chain. Da -da 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 -da. Go back, build it up. Scribble it down, write it out, however, whatever method you like to use, some digital app on your phone, whatever. But create a sequence. Work out what you want, get rid of everything you don't know what it is or don't want. Chains are the way to do it, or another way of doing it, by adding complex uh, scenarios. In this particular option here, we've got a filter rule that says input, output, forward, and the action has been set to jump. And once you've selected that, you then get this option. Jump target, well, where do you want me to jump to? The new chain. So the new chain, what does that look like? Well, it's called new chain. As I've, you now see in this line, we've got a new line here, and there's our chain, new chain. What's the action in our new chain? Well, it just says accept and allowed. It's nothing fancy, it's nothing complex, it's just another way of incorporating in another rule. And there we have a CLI example-ish and how you would look for it. So, what would you want through your firewall? Firstly, there's a term that we use, established and related packets. If you've already worked through your firewall and worked out what's good and what's bad, and you've allowed the good stuff to go through, well, that good stuff going out may, be ha may have something coming back in return. In other words, it's an established connection. And if it's an established connection, well, you don't want to be refusing the replies, because that's pointless. We want to have the replies back. So it's classed as an established connection. So the firewall will say, okay, this is an established connection, fine, you can come through. Related is effectively a stream that is associated with that established chain, uh, that established stream. Think of it, say, I don't know, VoIP, VOIP, however you want to pronounce it. Starts off with a SIP, connects up, and then the call is made, and hey, what's we got? We've now got a totally new protocol coming through to carry the voice on a totally different port, it's actually in, then in UDP, and so that's now deemed a related stream. So it's no good having the phone call ring, then picking up going, hello, hello. Oh, we're firewall in the voice part. Oh well, we better open that one up as well. So that's a related stream. Protocols, bit of a generalized term. What do we want to see through our firewall working? Well, I've listed there just a couple to start you off with, ICMP. Ping, as most of you probably understand it as. You don't mind the odd ping or two. Great. Um, 20 pings a second, you might start thinking, hang on, buddy. <laughs> yeah, you're taking the mick here. Create a new ICMP rule that says, fine, you want to know where I am, I'll let you have five pings in two minutes, that's it. After that, blocked. You're starting to create very complex, dynamic rules. But ICMP is required. Your router is needed to be known about. Because um, if it doesn't know where it is, well, how can you be found? And ping is part of well, The ICMP is part of the protocol, obviously, for all these uh, path discoveries and so forth. Routing. Routing protocols. It's no good blocking off routing protocols if your router's a router. Because if there's nothing coming in to tell it what to route, it's not a router anymore, it's just a dumb switch. 
So, routing, it could be BGP. Yeah, you might be into the BGP world out there and you're listening for your peer to come in and say, oh, ah, yeah, here go, here's my announcement. Great, I know who you are, I'll let you through my firewall. You though, not so sure on, you're blocked. So you could be filtering out your BGP protocols. OSPF, there's a whole host of them in there that you could be filtering. Um, we're looking at VPNs. You want to get into your network from the outside world? Well, it's no good locking it off. You'll never get into it. So your firewall then, you'd say, right, okay, it's me because I'm coming in on this port I've made and I've hidden it way up there so nobody else knows about it. Uh, fine, I'll let connections come in on that port. So your firewall really is quite complex. It does take time to work out. It takes longer than me for, me for me to explain here because at the moment all I'm basically trying to say to you is make sure you've got one. Um, when it comes to firewall efficiency, Deal with the biggest bulk of packets first. Process the unwanted, the known bad packets and traffic, and then process the wanted and the known good packets and traffic. Get them out of the way. If you know about them, why sit there filtering it and playing with it? Get it off, go. If you know that it's bad, well go. I don't need to process you any further. I don't need to do any more filtering. Then all that leaves you with is the bits that you don't know about. And you'll find that's probably about this much of the traffic coming in compared to this much of all your user data that's already going in and out. If you hand it the other way around, your CPU will be sort of 70, 80 percent. It's constantly burning out trying to work out because it's processing this first before it's doing that. And it's holding up all the good stuff while it's processing all the bad stuff, all the new stuff. So get your efficiencies right. Deal with the bulk first, get rid of it. Then deal with the new stuff afterwards. Um, anything else to consider? <sighs> yeah, <laughs> it's never ending. I mean, I keep stopping and breaking. Oh, is there any more? Yes, there is more. All I can effectively say now is let's start hardening up a little bit more. Restrict the network these services are allowed from. Perhaps even contemplate changing the listening port with the term security by obscurity. So you've got SSH listening here on 22. Watch your logs. Probed, 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 probed. Oh, look, he's just tried user root. Root, admin, admin, admin one, admin two, root two, root. The list goes on. I mean, you can be probed on SSH for hours with constant you know, um, brute force attacks. So, move it. I was sat at 10022 for a long, long time, probably six or seven years, and hardly saw any probing going on at all. Until recently, um, probably in about the last 18 months, I've now started to see 10022 being probed. One, great, they've learned. The script's out there, they're getting better, they're starting to move it up. Um, so by all means, find a port that you're happy with, move it. If you want to listen to the whole of the world, you know, you out there, you might just want to leave your SSH on, stick it up on a higher port. Where would you do it? There. Open up your services, change the port number. As I said, this is just security by obscurity. This doesn't stop them from having a go at it. This just moves it out, out of reach to most of the scripts that are automatically running. Alternatively, limit it you may find that you are always connecting in on your mobile phone and you know the IP range that your mobile phone is connecting in from. Stick the range in there. It's not the whole internet, but it's definitely shrunk it down to a smaller portion. Um, or don't allow it at all from outside world and use other methods. Uh, there we have our breakdown again with the, the CLI from what I just mentioned there. Shh. Consider updating your SSH with options like stronger crypto, larger key sizes, importing certificates for authentication. Again, see the wiki for this one. There's a lot of information there. The wiki does have all this stuff. All I'm doing is pointing out the parts that you really should be looking at to increase the security of your system. Uh, as we said, disabling all IP services and using a method called port knocking. Who's heard of port knocking? Good. Good, the word's getting out there. Um, port knocking, yes, a technology, or sorry, a technique which you use the firewall to monitor for a sequence of events that then triggers an access mechanism. 
Again, check the wiki for information on how it is. There's plenty out there. It is very, very simple to accomplish. You effectively have nothing listening. But your firewall is going, oh, he's just done. That's the special knock. I'll open up SSH for him. Here you go. Port knocking. It is that simple. Reverse path filtering. This is another one of those little tips. It's way out there. Drop packets that appear to be spoofed. Spoofed. What does that mean? Well, it basically means you'll get a packet and it says, well, I'm from this IP. Really? That's my network. You didn't come in on the right port. You're, you're, don't want you. You spoofed. That's one way of looking at it. What do we do? Dropped. You're nothing to do with me. You'll get a lot of this with various hacks and tacks and DDoSs that are going on. Um, so you can switch on this reverse path filtering. Drop packets that appear to be spoofed. Uh, example, packets attempting to leave your network with the incorrect source IP address. It would indicate you have a system that's infected. If you noticed it, check it. Get all your systems checked. Um, ever so simple to sit, switch on. IP settings, set RP filter equals strict. It's not in Winbox. I've, I've looked. <laughs> I can't find it. I looked over and over again for a couple of years. It's still on the, the command line only that I can tell. Oh, no, sorry, not this one. It's another one. Um, it is in Winbox. It's in IP settings. I was thinking of another setting. Um, RP filter, strict. Sorry, the one I was thinking of that is only in, is that. That's the only thing in, Win, in uh, CLI. It's not in Winbox, the, the SSH options. Um, this one, yes, it's in Winbox. You can find it as IP filter. We have three options, non, strict, or loose. You do have to be careful with this particular filter. Um, yeah, when using RP filter, it can be implemented on, indivi it can't be in, uh, implemented on individual interfaces. So it's either on, listening to everything, or off. Sadly, sometimes you would like a little bit more control and say, I only wanted to listen to my internal range or this particular IP port or that. It's not possible that the way it's been implemented, it is either all or nothing. And this does lead rises to possible problems if the router is part of what we call a multi-home network. For those that know what that is, fine, you'll understand. I'm not even gonna contemplate trying to teach what a multi-home network's all about. And finally, some common sense practices for the more advanced. Routing protocols, if you're playing with OSPF version 2, use authentication between your routers. Um, I know it's not strong, MD5, but it's better than nothing, okay? And the other thing is with OSPF, don't broadcast it down interfaces that are connected to end users. Make them passive, make those interfaces passive. That's the first two. Um, BGP, how would you filter that? Well, you've got filters. Only allow the routes that you want to have to and to send to. And your firewall. Only allow the peers you want to see and talk to. That's pretty much covers as much as I can find as regarding hardening up your routers and giving you advice and guides as regarding what the factory default doesn't do for you and other bits you then need to look at. Any questions? <coughs>